you know, countless genocide scholars, Holocaust scholars, international legal experts, even the International uh, Court of Justice are saying is a genocide or is plausibly a genocide in the case of the ICJ. Our government won't use the term in the United States. Our media won't use the term. They might mention that, oh, so-and-so says it's a genocide, but they won't adopt it on their own. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Spass, and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, this interview is part of the Stones Cry Out series of webinars culminating this month in Washington, D.C., September 23rd to 25th, for meetings, direct actions, and other important gatherings. Please help us to spread the word widely and join us in D.C. September 23rd to 25th. You see that we have an all-star lineup of speakers ready to join us in Washington, D.C. The final webinar uh, in our series, and please, if you uh, want more information, as it says here, or to register, write Doug Thorpe, uh, one of our co-sponsors, dthorpe at spu.edu. The next uh, webinar in our series is next Wednesday, September 18th, one o'clock Eastern time, when we'll be talking with Mark Braverman of Kairos USA and Jonathan Kutab of Friends of Sibyl North America. We hope you'll join us for that webinar as well. Thank you uh, too to our uh, uh, sponsors that you see listed here and to our partners, uh, Mark Braverman of Kairos USA and Doug Thorpe from the Episcopal Bishops Committee for Peace and Justice in the Holy Land, Diocese of Olympia. So thanks to all these co-sponsors. So we're delighted today to welcome one of the most important and incisive political uh, and analysts in our country, journalist and founder of the Electronic Intifada, Ali Abunima. Ali, uh, it's great to see you. Welcome today. Thank you for your kind words, Michael. Thank you for organizing this. It's good to see you again, and it's good to see many friends here. I recognize many of the names, and I know that many of the people who are part of this event today have been working for justice in Palestine for many years, and I'm grateful to all of you for that. So, Ali, let's jump right in. Uh, you Yesterday, you had your usual live stream, uh, but what wasn't usual about it was, well, uh, I'll just read what you sent out. YouTube has just placed a punitive freeze on the Electronic Intifada's channel, alleging that several previous live stream segments violated their opaque community guidelines. We vigorously reject this. Our careful reporting and analysis are professional, ethical, and factual. Tell us more about uh, what's going on. Yes, um, it was. It all happened just a few hours before the live stream yesterday, so we had to scramble to make sure that we could inform as many people as possible that they could still tune in. Most people do do so by YouTube because it's such a, you know, a huge and influential platform. But luckily, we were able to stream on Facebook and Twitter and other platforms and i hope many people got to see it and for those who didn't later today at the electronic intifada we'll have up an article which will have the video and you can watch it uh, if you weren't able to um basically uh we were told that three videos all of which were actually i think the most recent was from july uh, but the oldest was i think from february or march violated their community guideline on what they call violent criminal organizations. And of course, by that, they don't mean the Israeli army, which is what I think of when you say a violent criminal organization. They, of course, following uh, our governments, consider Hamas to be a violent criminal organization. 
what we do, as many of our regular viewers will know, is we provide, I think, first-class analysis. Uh, my colleague, our contributing editor, John Elmer, provides second-to-none military, political, and tactical analysis of what is happening on the ground in Gaza that you cannot get anywhere else in the English language. And so we are showing videos uh, that are being done in a context of journalism. And we are editing them very carefully, almost too carefully, in terms of removing any graphic violence. We don't show people being injured or people being killed, just so we can educate people. And yet YouTube took us down. Um, now, I've spent most of today, I, I, I don't know if I mentioned this, I'm actually in Amman in Jordan, so it's evening here. So I spent most of today looking into this, and what I have found is that there is systematic, I mean, this isn't news, but I looked in detail, systematic uh, censorship of Palestine-related content by YouTube uh, and there was a big report on that in Wired magazine in July. And then the, the Palestinian Haifa-based organization, Hamla, has, does a big report, did a big report on it in April. So it seems like we're victims of that. Um, and unfortunately, there's very little accountability because these in the US, we have the First Amendment. Uh, so the government can't come and tell us what we can and can't say, but the censorship is still there and it's done through these big social media companies and that's what we're facing. And um, we intend to be back on YouTube next week. The ban will expire. And, uh, you know, they could do it again anytime. They could take down our channel. There's no guarantees, but what choice do we have except to keep telling the truth and educating people? You know, Ali, uh, thanks for that update. Um, you know, one of the things I appreciate most about uh, the electronic intifana, uh, intifada is that uh, on a daily basis, you share personal stories of people and families. I mean, we get all the statistics, right? Anywhere from 40,000 to 180,000 dead, the devastating destruction and all the rest. But you give us that. And you also give us the personal stories. Today, for example, Electronic Intifada uh, shared the story of Abu Ajwa, whose daughter Tala, 10 years old, was killed September 5th. And uh, a picture of her body under a shroud, still wearing her pink roller skates. You, you personalize the genocide. These are real people. They're not numbers, right? They're real people undergoing real suffering in real time right before our eyes. And you bring us that. Yeah, I, I feel like that's the most important thing we do is to provide a platform for our friends, our colleagues, our loved ones in Gaza and indeed across Palestine to tell their stories, to tell their reality, to bear witness to this genocide. And... Um, you know, that's, of course, it's urgent. We need people to know urgently because we want to stop this genocide right now. But I also feel like we are accumulating an archive that um, will not allow anyone in the future to say they didn't know. And it's so horrifying and extraordinary. People say this is the first live stream genocide and and in a in, in a sense, that's true. What amazes me is that our writers continue to work in the midst of this genocide. Uh, they want to be heard. They want to be seen. They want their voices out there. And we, you know, I, I feel like it's the honor of our life that that we're able to do that. And we do it because people support us to do it because nobody else is, I mean, I won't say nobody else is doing it. There are wonderful publications, but I don't know of any other publication that, that has published the volume and consistency and quality of the reporting from the ground in Gaza uh, in, in terms of writing by ordinary people. You know, right. some of our writers are, um, you know, 
trained and professional journalists, certainly, but most of them are students, teachers, workers who just uh, feel the need to tell their stories. And many of them, I'll say, were students or mentees of the late Dr. Rifat al uh, who was murdered by Israel on December 6th. He was a dear friend of mine, and he inspired so many people. The more time passes since his murder, the more I realize what an impact he had, because it is really to his credit, almost alone, that this sort of culture and practice of people in Gaza, young people in Gaza, writing in English and communicating with the world is his creation. It's his work. And the fact is, you don't see that coming from the West Bank. We we struggle sometimes to find writers in the West Bank. And, and that's not a coincidence. That's because Dr. Rifat wasn't in the West Bank. He was in Gaza. How did how did the term genocide get so normalized in the West? I mean, we we keep repeating that that it, what's happening is the very definition of genocide. It's not the it's not just the war on Gaza or war on Hamas. I mean, it's it's the war, not even the war on Palestinian people. It's on the very idea of Palestine itself, the erasure of Palestine from human memory, and yet. You, we speak the word genocide, and it's like speaking into the air. How, how did that term, which is the worst, one of the worst possible terms that you can use that a, a, a people can visit upon another people, and yet it's become normalized. How did that happen in the West? You know, there's something very interesting, Michael. Prior to this genocide in Gaza, the term had become devalued through politicization. And what I mean by that is the United States government started applying the word genocide to uh, to sort of its official enemies or countries it wanted to tarnish and saying there's a genocide here and there's a genocide there. Even when scholars, uh, people who study genocide, who've studied it for decades, said, you know, this this really, the evidence isn't there or it doesn't meet the criteria. Now, when we have what, uh, you know, countless genocide scholars, Holocaust scholars, international legal experts, even the International uh, Court of Justice are saying is a genocide or is plausibly a genocide in the case of the ICJ, our government won't use the term in the United States. Our media won't use the term. They might mention that, oh, so-and-so says it's a genocide, but they won't adopt it on their own. So I think that's important to say. But when it comes to actual authorities, people who are really qualified and who have the credibility in terms of their impartiality to say what this is, say this is a genocide. And they also say, you know, and I'm talking about statements that came out from mid-October from, there were statements from hundreds of genocide and Holocaust scholars and international legal jurists. There was Craig Mukhaibar who resigned from his position at the United Nations for its refusal to deal with this as a genocide. Uh, there was the statement by the special rapporteurs uh, the UN Special Rapporteurs, those are the independent human rights experts, warning about a genocide. There were Israeli genocide and Holocaust scholars who said this is a genocide, and of course, the first people to say it was a genocide, but they don't tend to get listened to, were Palestinians. And South Africa's case at the ICJ documented, because the thing to understand about genocide in a, as a legal concept is that it is a crime of intent. In other words, the, there, it is certain acts that must be carried out with the intent in whole or in part to destroy uh, a, a national or eth ethnical group as a people. So you can have ethnic cleansing or extermination or all sorts of horrific crimes that are not deemed genocide in a legal sense because the intent to destroy that people isn't there. Maybe you're you're ethnically cleansing them because you want to take their land, but you don't care if as a people they go. I mean, it gets sort of macabre to, to try to pass this out. 
But the point I want to get to is very simple, that in no case, usually with genocide, and this is what Craig Mukhaibar and others have explained to us in their many writings and interviews, usually the hardest part of proving a genocide is proving the intent. Because even to this day, there's no written order from Hitler saying exterminate the Jews as Jews. So nobody doubts that that's what happened, but there's no written order because in history, people who plan to commit genocide generally don't write it down, don't write down in their diary, I'm going to commit a genocide today because this is a crime they don't want to be discovered. In this case, as the South African filing showed, the Israelis are absolutely open about their genocidal intent. There is no state, no genocidal actor that has ever, be, ever been more explicit from day one as when you have Galant, the, the defense minister said, we're going to um, you know, cut off all the food, the water, the electricity, the medicine, the fuel to the human animals in Gaza. When Isaac Herzog, the president of Israel, got up, and he's often considered a you know a peace-loving liberal, and said there are no civilians in Gaza. When Netanyahu said they're Amalek, uh, and I, I I know that this group is well versed in in the meaning of 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 the word Amalek. There has never been a more well-documented genocide in terms of the actions and the intent. Uh, Ali, you, you're in Amman now, but you live in uh, Chicago. So let's get right to that. Uh, recently uh, held the Democratic National Convention. The, De the, the Democratic Party now is energized, and especially after Vice President Harris's successful uh, debate uh, this past Tuesday. They're rejoicing. Yet, Ali, as you know, thousands were outside the convention center in Chicago protesting the DNC's and the Biden-Harris support for Israel. Uh, Palestinian voices were not allowed to speak at the convention. And in the debate this past week, uh, she continued to perpetuate the unproven and false Israeli claims that Palestinian resistance fighters raped Israeli women. Talk to us about the state of the Democratic Party, the state of the election, Vice President Harris. I mean, you've only been asked this probably a thousand times in the last couple of weeks, but weigh in on all that for us. You, you know what I'm asking. Yeah, well, you've just summed it up, honestly. I mean, I, I'm not sure I can say a lot more about it than that, but to say that I think for Palestinians, it's very uh, difficult when people tell us, oh, well, it would be worse under Trump. What would be worse under Trump? What is worse than genocide? If genocide is not the deal breaker for you, if genocide is not the thing that makes you say enough is enough, I don't know what does. And I don't know the answer. I don't know how to get us out of this bind, but I'm certain that uh, neither Donald Trump nor uh, Kamala Harris have any intention of ending this genocide, of ending the U.S. support and complicity in this genocide. And so I don't think the answer can be found at the ballot box. Genocide is, 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 uh, is a given. I do feel personally, I don't tell people how to vote. I think that's a matter for people's conscience. But, um, you know, for me personally... Uh, and I get told this all the time. People say, well, if Donald Trump comes back, you will be the first one. You as a Palestinian, you as a person of a Muslim background, you as, as whatever it is, you will pay the price. Well, there's no price. I mean, first of all, we had four years of Donald Trump. I mean, I, I'm not uh, saying it was great by any means, uh, but uh, we survived it. And there's nothing Donald Trump will do to me that is worse than what the United States is doing to Palestinians. And I feel that those who are perpetrating this genocide, which is currently not Donald Trump, need to pay a price. They should be punished. This is my feeling. And, uh, and if that means that I'm going to suffer some discomfort or 
face some additional uh, risk or inconvenience because of that? Well, how can I say that anything I would face would be worse than what the United States government is doing to Palestinians right now? So my view is uh, I, do, I won't reward genocide. I won't uh, vote for those who have carried out genocide, and I believe they should be punished. The correct way to punish them would be in a court of law, but that's not available to us. Uh, and I certainly would personally, again, I'm speaking for myself. I'm not suggesting to anyone what they should do. I will not reward uh, the people who perpetrate, who are perpetrating this genocide uh, with my vote. Let's return to, um, let's return to the um uh heroic efforts of journalists, uh, even citizen journalists in Gaza. I, I want you to talk to us about uh, why, in your view, the, the Western media is so complicit and so intent on supporting Israel's propaganda. Israel is now, it has been uh, for, for years, but particularly since October 7th, targeting journalists and particularly Palestinian journalists, over 120 uh, murdered since uh, October 7th. Electronic Intifada daily fights the good fight trying to stem the tide of these lies and false narratives that we hear so many other places. Talk to us about this war on truth that's taking place that your organization, Electronic Intifada, has been fighting the good fight against. No, yeah. thank you for that, Michael. And I, I think the numbers I've seen uh, now, it's its close to, it's certainly over 150 Palestinian okay. journalists who've been, who've been murdered. It's again, you know, it, it it's uh, every day it's happening. Um, and we, several of our writers have been killed, several we don't know where they are. Um, and again, they're not always professional journalists, they're ordinary people who are just, you know, facing what everyone else is facing. Um, Israel does target them. It, uh, it, it, it's open about that. Um, it, you know, it will claim as it did when it, it recently murdered Ismail al-Ghul, it claimed that he was, you know, a Hamas operative, but they say everyone is a Hamas operative. There, there's no substance to that. And Israel clearly wants to deter and kill and punish journalists for telling the truth. That's why they murdered, uh, I'm convinced that's why they murdered Dr. Rifat al-Arir, because he was so successful at communicating with the world. He had a huge platform, um, and they murdered him for that. Um, and Where's the solidarity? You know, when you look at our so-called media in the United States or in the West generally, I mean, they make such a big fuss over this this Wall Street Journal journalist who is detained in Russia, and he becomes a hero, and he's on the front pages, and he's and I'm not saying uh, you know they shouldn't have solidarity with him, but there's been no solidarity for Palestinian journalists, none whatsoever, and I I think that how does that make sense? Is it hypocrisy? Is it inconsistency? Actually, it isn't. It's that our media, when you talk about the big media, they follow the line of the government. Because the United States government sees Russia as an adversary, they feign sympathy with any American journalist who's detained in Russia. Because Israel is our friend and Israel, we're on the side of Israel. We don't care when Israel kills journalists. We don't even care when Israel kills American citizens. I mean, that that's the reality. Look what happened the other day. There was a State Department briefing right. after this, after the several Israeli captives, uh, including several soldiers, were killed in Gaza, one of them being a dual U.S. American citizen. And there was a state the, the State Department briefing. We had uh uh, who was it? Um, uh, Matt uh, Matt Miller, who said the United States has a long memory when it comes to those who harm American citizens. Meaning, you know, ten years past, twenty years past, we'll go after them, we'll kill them, we'll send a drone for them, whatever it is. And then a couple of days later, Aisha Nur Egi, an American citizen, is murdered in cold blood, shot in the head, 
and they wouldn't even acknowledge it. They're still not even acknowledging that Israel did it. And the same with Shirin Abu Akleh, and the same with Omar Asad, the the eighty year old grandfather from Milwaukee who retired and went back to his village in the West Bank, who was murdered in cold blood by Israeli soldiers, an American citizen who lived in the U.S., who paid taxes for 40 years, who raised his family in the United States. The U.S. government has refused to do anything for his family. They have been demanding that the the Justice Department investigate his murder. And then just recently, the U.S. government declined. They'd done an investigation under the Leahy law, and then they declined to impose any sanctions on the unit that carried out his killing, the Netzach Yehuda Battalion. And there have been two Palestinian-American children murdered by Israeli soldiers during this genocide in the West Bank, and and probably an unknown number of Palestinian-Americans murdered in Gaza during this genocide. So they don't care about American citizens who are murdered by Israel. How are they going to care about journalists, Palestinian journalists? And that's the reality. The guy, I mean, I, I want to just bring it back very briefly to your question about the media. Our media functions as an arm of government propaganda. That was always true to a certain extent. But there has never been a time in my life when it has been more true, when it's been more uniform, when it's been more obvious. Even the so-called progressive media uh, uh, that won't touch Palestine with a 10-foot pole or serves the interests of the government, the corporate-owned corporate owned media. I'm so glad you brought up uh, uh, Aisha Noor Eggy and uh, uh, Shireen Abu Akhle and Rachel Corey and other American citizens. That was going to be my next question. So um, uh, I'm I'm so glad uh, that you uh, and, and Rachel Corey's you. parents. That I I didn't mention her, but I thank you for doing that. But Craig and Cindy Corey made a a really moving statement. Uh, I don't have it in front of me, but I'm sure you can find it at the Rachel Corey Foundation calling for accountability uh, for Aisha Noor Egi and uh, uh, expressing sympathy with her family because they've been through this. They've seen firsthand the callousness of the U.S. government when an American is murdered by one of Washington's friends. Ali, when we were in, we led a delegation of 23 church leaders to um, uh, Palestine uh, in uh, um, February and March. It's the first iteration of the Stones Cry Out uh, uh, delegation. And we heard again and again and again about this slow uh, genocide. It's not so slow anymore. Not only in Gaza, which is you know really happening in, in an intense way, but also a slow genocide in the West Bank. Do you want to talk about that? The genocidal intent, the slaughter, the daily massacres in Gaza are so obvious. And, you know, nobody here, I don't I don't need to say more about that in the West. But let's remember that the West Bank is Israel's main target. It always has been. And what we've seen is, particularly now in the northern West Bank, uh, Israel starting to imply apply Gaza-like tactics uh, in Tul Karim, in Jenin, in Tubas, in the refugee camps in the north of Gaza. And Israeli ministers saying we have to forcefully displace people, forcefully expel people like in Gaza under the pretext of doing military operations. But make no mistake, their intent is to expel the Palestinians here to Jordan, where I am now, where so many Palestinians already are living in exile. Um, and uh, if they're not stopped, they will do it. And uh, who's going to stop them? Not Kamala Harris, not Joe Biden, not Donald Trump. I believe that, well, first and foremost, it's it's Palestinian resistance in all its forms that is going to stop them or, or that has the potential to stop them. And our solidarity, which we have to continue to press and step up. But what has happened in Israel over the last few decades but we've sort of reached now the sort of the 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 climax of this is that the 
Now, there's a myth. I mean, I I, I don't want to take us off track, but there's there's often been a myth in American media that you have some extremist settlers and a responsible Israeli government. Yeah. And that's never been the case. The settlers have always been an arm of the Israeli government. They have been the, the means through which the Israeli government, and this is labor governments, so-called peace-loving governments, and uh, right-wing governments, the settlers have been the arm that they use to seize and hold the West Bank. That's always been the case. But you have now a particular settler ideology, the Kahanist ideology, that was marginal. Uh, you know, they, they were useful to the, you know, you could have in Israel a labor government led by someone like uh, Yitzhak Rabin or Shimon Peres uh, that was marketed to the world as a peace-loving government. And, and we want to have a peace process. But they were very happy to have the Kahanist settlers in the West Bank seizing hilltops. But it was important to keep the Kahanists sort of at arm's length out of the government to have plausible deniability so that Israel could continue to enjoy this status in the world as a liberal democracy while pursuing this land theft and ethnic cleansing. The transformation that has happened now is that the Kahanists are at the center of the government. They are the government. And, and they are determined to use every um, uh, apparatus of the state to achieve their goal, which is the complete ethnic cleansing of the West Bank. And we've been uh, uh, covering this on the Electronic Intifada for a decade the seizure of the Haram Sharif, the so-called Temple Mount, the destruction of the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and their replacement with the Jewish Temple. And uh, Itamar ben Gvir came out and said it recently, the national security minister, that his goal is to build a temple there. This movement, again, was marginal. Now it's essentially the government. It's very dangerous. I want to return back to the U.S. Uh, uh, and some issues here, uh, Ali. This past winter and spring, we found hope, uh, didn't we, in the voices of students on university and college campuses, hundreds of campuses. Uh, and, what's, and of course, the hope by college administrators would be that it would lose steam. This, this emphasis would lose steam over the summer. What are you hearing about... Uh, What's going on on the campuses with encampments and students picking back up again this fall? Well, it is already picking back up. Um, many schools have started. Many are just getting started. Some, you know, they, they're sort of throughout the month of September. And I don't think that the anger, the outrage, the horror has gone away. And I think the horror is rooted in this genocide in Palestine, but it's broader than that. Because, you know, if you see your leaders or your government being so callous, so cruel, so openly psychopathic when it comes to Palestinians in Gaza, you know, sending the bombs to blow babies to bits, and we're seeing babies literally in pieces pulled out of rubble every day you know you you open your phone and that's what you see every single day it's hard it's hard to say oh well that it's hard to comp compartmentalize it and say well oh that's just gaza but you know they're doing all these wonderful things everywhere else it robs the system itself it robs the institutions of any legitimacy and I think that's a process that is ongoing in the United States and has been for some years, but this genocide is accelerating it. And the consequences of that are profound. I can't predict what they'll be, but I don't think that uh, young people are going to be appeased by Kamala Harris's statement that, oh, we're working around the clock for a ceasefire. What do you mean you're working around the clock for a ceasefire? You're sending 2,000 pound bombs around the clock to, to blow 10 meter craters in refugee camps, making whole families evaporate. That's what you're doing. And that's what young people are seeing. So I don't think this is going to go away. I, I don't know exactly what form it will take, but the students I'm in touch with and the students we're hearing from are no less determined to keep up the pressure. And I hope they do because they're the conscience of the, of the United States. Who else 
mobilized on that scale in the United States other than students. And the repression they faced, I think, which many people said was unprecedented since probably the Vietnam War era, we should stop calling it the Vietnam War, we should call it the American invasion of Vietnam or the American war on Vietnam, uh, is because I think that um, the foundations of the system are shaking and the and the people in power are worried about that and so they've they they they're stopping the pretense of you know we're liberal people who love dissent and and free speech and uh, disagreement and they're just using an iron fist i mean i i was when i was in college in the us i came to the us uh i hate to say it 35 years ago uh we had occupations on campus. Students occupied the president's office. They they did all sorts of things. The university never called the police on them. They never called in riot police to beat up and tear gas and batten their students. This is a different era we're in, and it's because I think the whole system is being exposed. I want to follow up with you about the students and uh, this next generation of uh, activists. And I want to ask you a two-part question. Uh, one has has to do with the work that you do at Electronic Intifada. On, so we're noticing here, we've been holding protests to every Tuesday since October the 7th here in front mm -hmm. of our courthouse. We're finding young people who didn't even know we existed coming out because they're following this genocide on social media. So I want you to address social media. The other part I want you to address is that these students get in a way that our generation is now learning from them, the intersectional quality of justice movements, climate, Black Lives Matter, LGBTQ, women's uh, bodily autonomy. They're connecting these justice movements together. So we're learning from our young people, from these students in a way that we didn't get before in, that, uh, uh, in my generation. Can you address both sides of those with our next generation of activists? Absolutely. You know, the role of social media is fundamental because, I mean, that's that's without social media, where would the electronic intifada be? That's how we reach people. YouTube is a form of social media. That's how we reach people. We've reached in, in the past 11 months millions of people we weren't reaching before. We've seen our audience grow exponentially. And and that's because people, you know, they don't trust the traditional media. It's lost its grip. The the what should we call it? The establishment media, the government media. I mean, there was a time in the United States when there were three television channels, CBS, NBC, and ABC. And they all said pretty much the same thing. And you know, whatever Walter Cronkite said, that was what 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 went. Uh, we live in a different time now where, you know, Mitt Romney, I'm not on TikTok. Like I grew up with, uh, you know, the past. I'm very familiar with social media. I'm a big user of of X or Twitter, uh, and I have been now since uh, 2007. So quite a long time. But I'm too old a generation for TikTok. You know, TikTok is a generation below me. But I am or younger than me. I shouldn't say below. But you know what I know about TikTok is that there is an enormous amount of support for Palestine. It's absolutely viral. And Mitt Romney said it, you know, we have this move to um, to ban TikTok, which is absolutely ridiculous, under the pretext that it's some nefarious Chinese app to gather data on us, as if our entire lives are not already fully documented by American corporations and the American government. Like, I care that some Chinese company knows what I knows what breakfast cereal I eat. I, I'm much more worried about what the US government and US corporations know about me. But they created this this bogeyman about TikTok. But Mitt Romney was very helpful a couple of months ago and he came and said openly, I don't have the exact words in front of me, but I'm 
paraphrasing pretty closely that, you know, there's so much support for Palestine on TikTok. You know, the narrative is Israel's lost the control of the narrative. That's why we have to ban it. Mitt, Mitt Romney said the thing he wasn't supposed to say. And so that's why we're facing all this this increasing censorship and it's always under a guise you know look at what they're coming up they're rehashing now they're dragging up the oh russia is going to interfere in the election iran is going to interfere in the election this is all a cover to justify more control and censorship you know who they never talk about interfering in the election israel and apac because if there was any sincerity to that if they really cared about the integrity of elections they would the, the first target would be the one country or the one lobby that interferes in elections very openly and brags about it which is israel's lobby they never talk about that it's all a cover and an excuse to uh, to stop us from having the kind of free discussion and debate we're having regarding what israel is doing uh it's uh it's a wonderful segue because that's exactly what my next question was going to be i was going to ask you to say a word about apac um uh, 15 million dollars and more to defeat jamal bowman 8 million and more to defeat cory bush uh fortunately ilhan omar won her primary um uh, rashida talib is going to be talking with our delegation in dc in a couple of weeks so in addition to APEC's influence, so talk to us a little bit about Palestinian political organizing. Uh, it seems like it's starting to happen more and more. I mean, we have Jim Zogby, uh, 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 Arab American Institute. He's an insider, right? Uh, he's a member of the DNC. But I, I see more and more with American Muslims for Palestine. Our friend Osama Abu Rashid is going to be speaking with our group. When we're in D.C., he's a good friend. Talk to us about Palestinian political and Arab political organizing in the U.S. as well. Yeah, I mean, I personally, of course, I follow this, but I'm not personally involved in, in that kind of electoral organizing. I don't say people should do it. It's just I, people do different things. And I, I, I don't, uh, you know, I, I just don't have the extra time and bandwidth to engage in that but from from my somewhat one let's say one step removed perspective i think the big debate is is where and how to organize and i think um there is a debate about whether anything can be done within the democratic party you know that that was the um sort of uh I think made apparent at the DNC where you had the uncommitted movement, which is largely people who are within the Democratic Party. And and you could say that what their experience demonstrated is that they were able to show uh, with the primary elections that happened in the spring that uncommitted in the states where you could vote uncommitted, you can't vote uncommitted in Illinois, but you can in Minnesota, you can in Michigan, you can in some other states. And in those states, they got very significant numbers of people to vote uncommitted. Um, far more than you get in a normal election cycle. Uh, and yet, that didn't translate into any influence at the DNC. They couldn't even get a delegate on stage for five minutes. And that raises the question. And then, of course, you look at the things ha Kamala Harris is saying that, you know, we, we, we talked about. And more importantly, what the Democratic Party in power is doing, which is to continue to fuel and support and arm this genocide, it raises the question as to whether that kind of organizing remains viable. I don't have the answer, but I'm just saying that's a question that's being raised. We see a lot of other people putting energy into the Green Party, and their positions are much more clear and much more moral and much more defensible. And people saying you have to, there has to be a price if you keep just voting for the same party that, that screws you over time, over time, they're never going to change. And I think there's a lot of logic to that and i i think that's personally where i come down um but you know i so i don't know the answer and i i think that that people i i never want to discourage people from being involved and active 
but I think there have to be um, hard discussions about uh, we all have such limited energy and uh, resources and so there always has to be a good strategic discussion about where to put them for the most effect and um uh and that's that's where i come down on it i think those those hard discussions need to be had you referenced uh, south africa before in international law uh the united nations we've seen a number of rulings by the icj and the icc calling out Israel's plausible genocide and uh, talking about the criminality of Israel's leadership. And we activists, of course, applaud and celebrate those legal victories. Yet it seems like nothing changes on the ground. Um, talk to us about why international law still matters. Uh, and uh, um, what, what we're up against. Uh, against U.S. empire and its protection of Israel. Why are these rulings important if indeed they still are, which we hope, we believe they still are, but weigh in on that. Well, that's exactly the same question I've put to international legal experts that we've had on the Electronic Intifada live stream. A few weeks ago, we had the very distinguished Michael Link, uh, who, is, who was previously the special rapporteur for human rights in the occupied Palestinian territories, someone who I really respect uh, and who has tremendous knowledge and experience. He's also, of course, a distinguished international law professor in Canada. And I put that exact same question to him because there was all this sort of excitement and euphoria in January when we had the International Court of Justice preliminary ruling, and then months go by and nothing happens. And you wonder, is, is any of it does it does it matter? Uh, we had, of course, Karim Khan, uh, the uh, International Criminal Court prosecutor, uh, put in the applications for the International Court of uh, the International Criminal Court for arrest warrants for Benjamin Netanyahu and Yoav Gallant. Absolutely unprecedented, but then months go by and nothing happens, and. Uh, it's it's hard not to despair and to say the system is so rigged for Palestinians that these institutions are just completely exposed as a sham. And 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 when it comes to the International Criminal Court, you know when the the procedure is that uh, the chief prosecutor makes a request to the judges and says, "I would like you to issue arrest warrants." You know, in the United States or in other systems. A prosecutor can issue an indictment. At the International Criminal Court, it's different. The prosecutor has to request the judges to make the indictment and issue the arrest warrant, and the judges will review it and they'll decide whether to do it. Well, as far as I understand in the International Criminal Court, this is always pretty much a formality. In almost all cases, the judges issue the warrants, and usually that happens within a few weeks. I'll give you an example. In the case of Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, it took three weeks. And that was on a pretty thin charge to do with Ukraine about evacuating children from the war zone, which, you know, the, the indictment claimed that this is, um, you know, violating the Fourth Geneva Convention that prohibits the um, transfer of civilians from an occupied territory to the territory of the occupier. Well, well and good. Israel has been doing that for decades, putting children in prisons. No indictments for that. Took three weeks. Now we're, what, three months? No indictment. So, you know, I, I understand the skepticism that anyone would have. But if I were to channel Michael Link, and of course, I don't want to misquote him. Uh, but what if I reflect back what he said to us, it's that these things do matter because the wheels of justice, especially international justice, move slowly. But the recent ruling by the ICJ, the advisory opinion, for example, he considered that tremendously important because, and now I'm talking about the advisory opinion that ruled that the occupation itself of the West Bank and Gaza Strip is illegal. Because, you know, this might seem arcane for many of us, but previously, 
the position in international law is that many of the things Israel does in the context of the occupation are illegal, building settlements, uh, you know, killing people, demolishing houses, and so on and so forth. All of this is illegal, but the occupation itself is not illegal because a uh, military occupation is something that is, that, that is, is governed by a framework of law. What they've ruled now is that the occupation itself is illegal. And that breaks ground that should trigger action by other governments, corporations, and so on. Will it? Probably. Will it do it as fast as we want? No. We have a question in the chat room uh, following. It's a follow-up question, Ali. What does Ali think about the fact that the Israelis are now trying to get American politicians to put pressure on South Africa to rescind its case against Israel at the uh, uh, IC, uh, uh, C, uh, J. You want to weigh in on that real quick? Yeah, of course, I'm not surprised at all. And they'll use whatever threats and leverage they can against South Africa, financial pressure, bullying. This is normal and this is not new. Um, and so, of course, they'll do that. Doesn't surprise me. Uh, we have to remember, I mean, I, I I don't want to get too much into internal South African politics, and I'm not, uh, I can't claim to be an expert on them, but we do have the unprecedented situation of a coalition government for the first time in South Africa since the first national unity government. But now you have the ANC, which is very supportive and brought this case, but they are in coalition with the DA, the Democratic Alliance, which is actually the remnants in many respects of the National Party, which ran the apartheid state and tends to be more pro-Israel and pro-American and much more like the politicians we would recognize in the United States or Europe. So the ANC have been firm that they're not going to withdraw the case. I certainly I certainly hope that's that's true. I don't expect they will. But uh, I am not at all surprised that the U.S. will bring maximum pressure and bullying, uh, as, as it always does. Um, what uh, what happens when the fighting stops? What happens if, when there is a ceasefire? What what do you predict will happen next? And what do you think needs to happen next? Um, we want, I would like to see a ceasefire right now, an end to the war. Um, everyone wants that, except Israel and the United States government. Um, and for people across Palestine to be able to live free and normal lives. What can't, what Israel wants and what the United States wants is for a ceasefire and a return to the status quo or to a new status quo, which maintains Israeli-American control of Palestine and of Palestinian lives forever and ever and ever. And uh, so, you know, uh, we're going to decide who runs uh, Gaza. We're going to control the crossings. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We decide whether Hamas gets to be in power or not. And this is, you know, the same colonial mentality that Palestinians are fighting for liberation from. So what has to happen is liberation from this, liberation from this, this mentality and the status quo that, 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 Palestinians are to be treated like a problem that at best has to be managed and at worst can be exterminated. And I do not see, I don't know if this is your next question, you know, because Kamala Harris mentioned, oh, we have to have a path towards a two-state solution or whatever it is. This is all, I don't want to use uh, strong language here, but this is all, uh, let's say, poppycock, pop, <laughs> poppycock. Uh, the a genocidal state in Palestine can no longer exist. At the end of this, 
Palestine must be liberated and free from the river to the sea. What does that mean? It means what uh, Ilan Pape talked about when we had him on the uh, live stream, the electronic live Intifada live stream recently. It means what I've believed for much of my life, which is that everybody, uh, regardless of religion, regardless of ethnicity, has full rights. That looks a lot harder now in the context of, uh, of following a genocide, but I don't see the Israeli state uh, as as viable in the future. We can't just go back to pretending that this regime, you know, after World War II or at the conclusion of World War II, they said the Nazi regime has to go. We're not just going to sign a peace treaty with Hitler and carry on uh, with Germany as it was. Unfortunately, the Americans then rehabilitated many of the Nazis. That's another story that uh, we can go into another day. But I think most of us would agree that the Nazi regime had to go. Uh, I don't mind making that analogy. The Zionist regime has to go, a regime that is capable of this horror, of this pure evil that we're witnessing every day has no place in Palestine on any part of it. That doesn't mean that that Israeli people and Jewish people won't continue to live there, just as white people remain in South Africa, but it has to be under completely transformed conditions. We've been talking about the genocide in Gaza and the West Bank, rightly so. Uh, but Israel's uh, conducting assassinations uh, in Lebanon and in Iran uh, and more. One of the things Electronic Intifada does, as I said before, it focuses on the personal stories of everyday Palestinians and their families. But you also bring a global perspective. And so I'd like for you to talk about that, uh, Ali. Say some more about how Israel's attempting to draw the U.S. into a larger regional war involving Iran, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, Syria, and more. And why uh, why the United States is happily doing so. Well, you said it earlier, you alluded to, to this. The United States is an empire, and like all empires in history, it wants to stay an empire. And the United States sees its global influence uh, uh, rapidly diminishing. And in fact, the United States is hastening that by its actions. But if you look at it in terms of economics, uh, at the end of the Second World War, I think the United States accounted for 50% of global GDP. So clearly, the United States was the one dominant power. Today, the United States is a much tinier proportion. I don't remember the exact percentage, but it's 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 far, far, far below that. And so you have China, which is now on a par with the United States, probably richer when you take it in terms of purchasing power parity. China is probably the world's biggest economy. And the world is just not going to tolerate the United States pushing everyone around. And the United States seems to have, to the, the US elites seem to have this idea that they have a God-given right to rule the world. And the rest of the world isn't having it anymore. There, there was a long period where the rest of the world couldn't do anything about it. Now they can, and they don't have to take it. And so can, can we imagine a world in the way, which the United States, instead of Kamala Harris standing up and saying that she's committed to, you know, building up the U.S. armed forces and ensuring that they're the most lethal in the world, which she repeats constantly, said that we're going to work with China, work with Russia, work with India, work with all the big emerging powers to to end poverty, to uh, to ensure that everyone in the world gets an education, everyone has clean water, that we deal with the climate, that we do all these things together, that we build infrastructure for the world together, as China is doing with the Belt and Road Initiative. I mean, here in Amman, I mean, people in the US, I don't think understand how quickly China is gaining influence. Here in Amman, every other car now is Chinese. And 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 the U.S. And, and Jordan is, you know, as people know, a close uh, ally of the United States. I don't see any American cars. I don't even see European cars anymore. Everything is almost all the cars you see now, the new cars on the roads are Chinese. And that's going to be happening in all the world. 
the infrastructure, even here in Jordan, and this is more true in Iraq, it's more true uh, in other countries across the region, China is building the infrastructure. China, Chinese contractors built the new airport in Amman. It was a French conglomerate, but you see, uh, when I walked on the jet bridge, the jet bridge is made in China. This is a different world, and I think most Americans don't understand it. And the Americans want to fight their way to maintain dominance, and all they're doing is destroying the world in the process. And I think the world is sick of it. I'm not even sure if that answered your question. I'm not even sure if I remember your question, but that's what I think. <laughs> Uh, just as we did, uh, Ali, in February and in March, uh, many of us, uh, many of us on the call, and many of uh, folks around the country are going to be heading to Washington D.C. September 23rd and 25th. What I'm going to do right now is I want to invite our friend Mark Braverman in to say a quick word. So Mark's going to say a brief word about uh, uh, that visit, and then Ali, I want you to talk about the message that you believe we should be giving to our government representatives and uh, how we should be conducting ourselves when we're there. So Mark, let me unmute you. Uh, I'm gonna try to find you here. Yeah, all right, you're good. And then uh, I'm gonna let you, uh, I'm gonna make you a co-host and uh, hopefully you'll be able to share your video. Okay, great. Let's see if I can do that. Okay, great. Hi. Hi, Ali. It's nice to see you. It's been many Mark, years. Mark, it's good to see you again. Good to see you too. Yes. Um, okay, so thanks, Mike. Uh, just so very briefly, I'm sure as Mike has told you, um, the Stones Cry Out um, delegation is returning to Washington. We were there in March. Uh, it was a delegation of Christian, mostly Christian leaders, who went to the West Bank for uh, five or six days and brought back a very strong message to Washington. And uh, we combined gatherings in Washington with uh, visits to the State Department and to uh, Congressional and Senate offices. And we're doing that again. Um, this time, we have not gone to uh, Palestine formally, but we are regathering in Washington. And the focus is very much on uh, bringing a clear voice from American Christian clergy to the United States. Things have shifted since March. There's a lot more pressure um, on the government, including the serious defections of, uh, of government officials um, and more voices from the churches. And so we want to leverage that. Um, so we are going to, among other things, we're going to be officially on the steps of the Capitol, uh, having a public event to um, officially launch this declaration uh, called um, the Declaration of, there is another way for Israel-Palestine, the Declaration of Faith and Urgency from Christian clergy to the um, to the government of the United States. I just put that in the chat. Uh, click on that. Um, it is directed to clergy, um, but uh, so those of you who are clergy, please take a look uh, and sign it. Um, and those of you who are not, that's most of us, send it around to clergy you know, as well as to other folks who can spread it around. Um, we really try to balance uh, speaking prophetic language with also speaking in the currency of the United States government, which is, hey, you know, <laughs> this is not in our national interest to be seen uh, for there to be no blue sky between us and Israel. So we try to balance that. I think it's uh, effective, and um, we'll we'll keep uh, we'll keep. Um, distributing it as, as widely as possible. We, uh, um, uh, you'll see uh, on the, in the chat, thank you, Mark. We'll see in the chat that uh, the number of people who will be speaking, uh, including uh, Representative Rashida Tlaib, we'll be, we'll be zooming in Josh Paul, who resigned from the State Department uh, from London. And uh, also on Tuesday evening uh, at Busboys and Poets, uh, in, in addition to others, Lily Greenberg Call, the first Jewish uh, political appointee who resigned from the uh, Department of the Interior, Interior will also be joining us. Um, and so anyway, Ali, uh, thank you, Mark. And Ali, do you want to then weigh in about uh, your comments about our message in Washington, D.C.? 
Thank you, Mark. Well, I'm so glad that you're going uh, because the one thing we keep hearing from our um, friends and colleagues in Gaza is don't don't let up on the pressure. It's the one thing that is giving people hope. So you're going to Washington is directly answering the call of people in Gaza and across Palestine. And um, you know the message. I, I don't need to, although I've been speaking for an hour, I, I you know the message to carry. There, there has to be we don't want empty words about a ceasefire and the U.S. wringing its hands and pretending that they're doing everything when we know that they continue to send the bombs. So it has to be a very concrete message, one that I know many of us are already giving, that stop the weapons. This horror, this genocide couldn't be happening without the around-the-clock supply of U.S. weapons. And beyond that, I think we have to put this question of Palestine into the broader uh, question of peace. Nobody talks about peace anymore. Nobody talks about ending war. All our politicians talk about is we're going to be at war for as long as it takes. We're going to arm this group or that group for as long as it takes. Where is the diplomacy? Where are the efforts to actually bring about peace? The Secretary of State is no longer someone who engages in diplomacy, but someone who engages only in war and the rhetoric of war. So um, I just thank everyone and, and encourage you and, and, and give you my good wishes that when you go to Washington later this month, you go there knowing that you carry with you the hopes of many of us as Palestinians, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I can speak as an American, but now I'm speaking as a Palestinian, that we uh, need as many people to bring their voices and be heard in Washington and all over the country. So, uh, you know, God bless you and protect you on that journey and bring as many people as you can with you. Uh, any parting words for us? Yes. When I look at the names of all the groups, uh, sponsor, the sponsoring groups that you just showed, um, I'm reminded that, that many of you have been doing this work for years, if not decades. And you've been doing it when it seemed like nobody else cared about Palestine and nobody else cared about Gaza. And you, I think particularly of the divestment battles in some of the churches and how hard you had to work to convince people and how at times it felt. I know I got frustrated. I spoke to many groups that were doing the divestment and I just thought, come on, how hard is this? Uh, and yet you stuck with it so patiently and... Um, I think it's at a moment like this, it's often easy to feel despair. But I, I would say I I see great hope in the fact that you did that work for so many years and it bore fruit because now all those churches are coming out one after the other. I know it's not enough, but what we've seen in the past year has been more than we'd seen in the previous 10 years in some cases. And the country is with us. People are with us. The world is with us. We are on the right side. And it's easy to despair. And it's easy to feel like when we just see this slaughter going on, that we're powerless. We're not powerless. And uh, so I just I, I need to remind myself of that every day. And I just want to share that with you and to say thank you for all you're doing. Be encouraged. Be hopeful. Don't stop. Uh, we are going to get there. We are going to get there in the end. Of that, I have no doubt. I remember one time you you began, was it your book or was it a speech that I heard you give? I think it was your book saying, we are winning. Yeah. I still believe that. It was my book and I still believe that. At a terrible cost. At a terrible a cost none of us want to pay and none of us want to see our, our loved ones and our friends paying and 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 we want to end this as soon as we can but 
I have no doubt it can only end in liberation, in victory, in some kind of new dawn. We have no other choice. We are, what would it mean to give up? What would it mean to give up? That's not a choice. So keep going. Whatever your news sources are um, in the alternative media, on social media, uh, Electronic Intifada is a must read every day. It, as I said earlier, it, it combines the personal uh, and the intimate with the global. Uh, and uh, its political analysis is trenchant, as you were able to see from our guest today, our friend uh, Ali Abunima. Ali, my personal thanks and the thanks of everyone here on the call today. Uh, we appreciate your work and the work of Electronic Intifada so much. And please pass along our gratitude to all the many correspondents, both professional and citizen correspondents. Uh, pass along to them our thanks as well. Thank you.